Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Join Us Today. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kokom Lemli. We're on DTT because we're free to wear on DSTV channel. 421 and go tv channel 125 we are your home of independent fearless and credible journalism coming up this afternoon brace yourself for power outages in parts of the country in the coming days that's the warning from gridco as it emerges the shortage in gas supply to tema at peak hours also this afternoon, Gadangwe Council describes purported order of interim injunction on the funeral of the late Gamanye as distraction as it calls on invited dignitaries to disregard and join them in giving a befitting farewell to the late mother of the gas state. More as the central business district of Accra partially deserted with some shops closed as the capital gets ready for the burial of the Queen Mother. As on our Fear Delegate series today, we will be exploring what influences the interests of delegates ahead of the NPP presidential primary. We'll turn our attention to the Lejokuku constituency in Accra and other constituencies in the Ashanti region. Plus, are you ready for a night to remember? Adum FM is set to thrill patrons of this year's Adum Praise Festival with 11 remarkable choir bands from various churches. We have details of why you cannot miss it. We have business, sports, world news and showbiz coming up this afternoon. We're also live on Facebook, Instagram and uh, Twitter. Uh, join us on TV. My personal handle is at Danana Aisha. Please stay for details. The central business district of Accra is partially deserted with some shops closed as the capital gets ready for Saturday's funeral and burial of the Queen Mother of the Gun State. Now, day day on May Drew the third, the Gun Traditional Council ordered the suspension of all commercial activities, closure of all shops and markets within Accra on Saturday. But joining his visits to the CBD today, Friday, revealed the usual hassle and bustle are absent with shops and offices dropped in red and black colors. We will be taking you live to Max Salagbagba, who is there for us. But first, let's hear from the president of the Gandangwe Council and member of the planning committee for the upcoming funeral of the late Queen Mother of the Gas State, Ni Aikwe Otu, who is urging the public to, dis to disregard all distractions and celebrate the life of the Queen Mother as she is laid to rest tomorrow. When you do this sort of thing, you discourage people. And you know, we, we've, we've worked. We've had people coming to sign book of condolence. We've, we, 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 we've spent so much time, money, expense, traveling, going about informing dignitaries, prominent chiefs, politicians to come and mourn with us. All these people are holding themselves in readiness to come only for that bombshell to be released. Maxwell Agbagba joins us live with more. Maxwell, you've been to Jamestown and its environs. What can you report? Hello, Maxwell. Yeah, I'm at the central business district. This is Kingsway. This is the road that leads all the way um, to the central business um, district. What we have seen here is quite unusual for a Friday when we're getting ready uh, for the weekend. On my right hand side, just um, some meters away from me, you can see some headquarters, popularly known as Kaye, who are basically um, idle. Just some minutes ago, I've been interacting with them and they tell me um, that there are not many people 
in the central business district um, today. So what it means is that I'm carrying words from one point to the other. Uh, yeah, services not really needed um, today. So many of them um, are idle, just sitting down, just having conversations. Some of them also um, sleeping on the hard concrete floor there. This stretch of road, which leads all the way to the central business district, on a normal day, you will find a massive gridlock um, on this stretch. The bumper to bumper traffic, it will take you many minutes to get to the CBD itself. But as you can see here on the Kingsway stretch, all the way down there, it's empty. We just, um, we just streams of, we just vehicles, you know, just coming, not as many as you'll find on a Friday as we get ready, um, you know, um, for the weekend. On my left hand side also, uh, these men, um, Okada riders, who are here also, are also um, saying that they've been affected by the ongoing preparations because the central business district has been partially deserted. They say from morning, it's been really difficult getting passengers and then making money um, for their uh, uh, you know, uh, business. But what you would also find here when you come to the central business district is the many shops that have been draped in the um, red and black colors. All of them are um, commiserating with the, um, with the gun state. If we go indeed, if we go down there about 100 meters down, many of the shops are closed that are still draped in the red and black colors, um, Aisha. Yeah, the Maxwell Agwagba, who is monitoring events for us, events leading to the funeral of the Gamanye, who will be laid to rest this weekend. Now, brace yourself for power outages in parts of the country in the coming days. That's the warning from Gridco. In a statement released on October 26, the company said the power outages were as a result of a shortage in gas supply to Tema at peak hours. Head of Joy News Energy, Des Samuel Kujibris, Tell us more. We understand that we have a gap of 550 megawatts uh, power. Now, um, as of Wednesday, it was 650 megawatts at peak time. That's from 6 to 10 p.m. And then yesterday, it was 550 megawatts. So uh, that is what it is. And, and if, if nothing changes, this will continue. Now, for people to understand what this means, if we have a shortfall of 550 megawatts, it's like the whole of us probably not producing and another power plant not producing. It's, it's really huge. We have a debt of around $13 million as of uh, two months ago. And WACO has been demanding this. GMPC is the one responsible to pay. They haven't. We don't know why they have not paid. Now, if this does not, you know, if nothing is done for it to be settled, then of course, WACO has not given any indication of restoring, you know, uh, gas supply anytime soon. And therefore, we cannot tell as of now when this would, would, would last. Minority in Parliament says President Ekofuado must institute an inquiry into events leading to cancellation of the GCPC power agreement. The termination of that contract has led to the award of 140 million US dollars in judgment debt against a state with Ghanaian properties abroad at the risk of being auctioned to defray the debt. Former Energy Minister Boachie Jaku, who signed a termination letter, says he is not to blame as he actually on the decision of cabinet, but NDC MP for Pru East and former power minister Kwabena Donko says the explanations are not enough and that a full blown presidential inquiry alongside a parliamentary probe can help Ghana learn for the future as well as punish errant officials. First of all, I call for two inquiries one at the level of the presidency. The president might institute an internal inquiry to unravel what led to this. You see, cabinet, cabinet is advisory to the president. Cabinet is not the final decision taker of the land in terms of executive power. Cabinet is advisory to the president. So the president in cabinet is a different business because then the president has the power. And that is why I call in on the president to institute an internal inquiry for two reasons. To know 
where we really went wrong in terms of the process and what lessons that we have to learn as a nation at the level of the executive to avoid a recurrence going, going forward. Ghana is a going concern. So that is one. Then at the level of the legislature, since the decision to terminate was taken by the executive arm of government, it is the legislature that has oversight responsibility over the executive. We also have to set up an inquiry to find out who was culpable and why this happened and why we've been saddened or we've been burdened with over one forty million dollar uh, liability. Dr. Kwabna Donkoin says government officials exhibited high level incompetence in the termination of the contract. The Amandi and the Jacobson plans. The government decided that, okay, rather than come on stream in year X, you come on stream in year X plus two, and you come on stream in year X plus three. And exactly that happened. So this plant could have also been delayed if we were so minded. But I sincerely believe that we went about this wrongly. And there may be reasons that I do not know why they decided that this particular contract should be terminated. But even in terminating, we were so incompetent in process. Even in termination, we displayed incompetence in following the process set out by the contract. And that is part of our problem. We can go back to our issue on power outages in parts of the country in the coming days, which is a warning coming from Gridco, because in a statement it released on uh, October 26, the company said the power outages were as a result of shortage in gas supply to Tema at peak hours. Head of Joy News Energy Desk gave details of how this will be affecting us in the coming days. Thankfully, I've been joined by a member of the Mines and Energy Committee in Parliament, Edward Bauer. He's also MP for Bongo. Grateful for your time, sir. How serious is the problem we're facing, which could lead to power outages in the coming days? Uh, Asha, good afternoon. I think that the problem is serious, and until government is again, we're going to have problems. Why do I say this? Um, as part of uh, the gas transportation agreement between ECG and then the West African Gas Pipeline Company, that work to transport gas uh, from Abuagwe to the power plant in Tema. WAPO had demanded from government a guarantee because they knew that ECG would default in payment because their financial situation was bad. So um, what then happened was that over a period of time now, ECG simply does not pay for all the invoices sent to them by WAPO to pay for the transportation of gas from, uh, from Abuazi to Tema. Because they were defaulting and GMPC was the guarantor for that, they wrote to GMPC and GMPC subsequently wrote to ECG, telling ECG that they needed to pay the amount. What was the total amount? The total amount was $19 million. But because they were, the ECG was not paying initially, uh, GMPC decided to pay $2 million and just to tell them to just hold on. And WAPCO had threatened that if by the close of business on the 17th of October, ECG had not done at least the minimum payment of $8.31 million, they were going to shut down the pipeline. ECG never did, even though uh, uh, GMPC had written a series of letters to ECG to honor the, at least the minimum requirement. And so yesterday, they decided to carry through, I'm talking of WAPCO, carry through their threat, and they shut down the pipeline. And that was why uh, Gritco in his statement stated that there, were, there was some limited supply of gas to Tema, and therefore uh, the supply gap of 550 megawatts. So Russia, unless government, as we speak, 
immediately make a payment of the 8.31 million because government is the shareholder of ECB. Unless they make the payment of the 8.31 million US dollars, we will not have life saving today. Does your committee intend to press government, I mean, as a form of intervention, so we do not all sleep in darkness? Yes, obviously, I think that government and government people would have known that Ghanaian slept in uh, what they call it, darkness. They do not even need the promptings of the committee on mines and energy from parliament to do that. They have the responsibility to ensure that they keep the lights on. And so the only way they can do that is the sole shareholder of ECG. If ECG has a problem, they will have to intervene. And actually, I'm telling you, this is just a symptom of a lot of things to come. Uh, the IPPs are equally not being paid by ECG. And that alone, the debt indebtedness alone is about $2 billion. If IPPs also decide to run on ECG, I'm telling you, and the government does not intervene, we'll be in trouble. And so government must rise up to its responsibilities and find a way of resolving this issue before it gets worse. I'm grateful for your time. Edward Bauer is member of the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament and MP for Bongo. To other stories, a violent clash between the youth of Ajura and a police military team in June 2021 resulted in deaths and injuries, leaving the Ashanti regional town in a state of insecurity. But Interior Minister Ambrose Derry says the establishment of a formed police unit has helped improve security and ease tension as the government pays compensation to bereaved families and affected victims. Ejura residents, however, are disputing the minister's claim of improved security, saying all is not well. Or him interior of our security desk visited the community and has come through with this report. But now I can tell you that just as I acknowledge, the police have expanded their area of operation. Crime has reduced in Ejura as reported and beyond. And we are going to make sure that we continue to work together to make this police service more professional and more accommodating. Mr. Derry was speaking at the inauguration of a divisional police headquarters at Ejra, built in response to the recommendations of a ministerial committee tasked to investigate the 2021 unrest in Ejra, which led to the death of two people. Two persons, Abdul Nasir Yusuf and Mutala Mohammed, died following a clash between Irish youth of Ejra and the police military team. They were protesting the death of a social media activist, Ibrahim Mohammed, also known as Kakamechu. That June 28, 2021 incident also saw three persons, 20-year-old Louise Ayipa, Awal Mesbao and Nasif Nohu, aged 16 and 30 respectively, injured. The Justice George Kumsin's committee, in a 10-point recommendation, called for the payment of compensation to bereaved and affected families. It also called for structural expansion of the drug police station and increase in personnel. I took board decision. Three years after the incident, a dragony, Berma Osei Hedia II led the traditional authorities and mobilized residents to initiate construction of a divisional police headquarters at the cost of 1.8 million Ghana cities. This, according to the Adrahini, is to solve the area's security concerns. The committee, after, after weeks, weeks of investigations, made 10 recommendations. The 10 recommendations was call for expansion of Adria police station and an increase in personnel. While the government made strenuous efforts to provide solace to injured and families of the dead, I took bold decision to lead my elders to mobilize resources to help provide requested infrastructure that will facilitate increase of precious presence in town. From Ejra, my name is Ohim Interior for joining us.
fear delegates has become a popular statement during internal party elections in Ghana. It is believed that delegates are influenced in several ways in their voting decisions leading to the disappointment of some candidates. In today's episodes of Fear Delegate series, Nana Boachi Adam interacts with some delegates in Ichimangwa Bija, North Constituency, in the Ashanti region, ahead of the NPP presidential uh, primaries. I will not say fear delegates, fear human beings. Because the delegates haven't come from a different planet. The delegates are all human beings, some are even my relatives. For all you know, you even the interviewer, you are also a delegate. So I could also be afraid of you. We are born, we are born, Delegates, they say, but is that still the case? Okay, so I don't see your delegates. Okay, you may have to say, I'm you want to be a good person. I said, I'm going to be a good person. 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 Ah, <laughs> Iti eni pana ya omuko jina November fourth no, e waso musuru mu ankasa. Hundred percent, so, hundred percent. So na na sa omu jina ba campaign nusuwa, mudi omechi. Ah, na msa wuno umakura kustandia ba, umakura ano, ubi omo ba solieti yao. Enzo mu na bedi wachi. Ah, na yini ana yefense, papa we papa debi, papa we yefense, papa kusindum. Nikro mukra, nikro mukra na nikro. Ndajume ya fakwa tuwa beti yano. Ndajume ya fakwa afu mutoa kwa mutoa beti yano. Inti abatoa diye fear that getim diye. Papa sa wans wans fasad na tu tirmu diya. Eni mhu se diya na ukra wuns ruina me. Enu kwa sruya kwa cha bonsam. Delegate for he sruya delegate. Echa bonsam. But boss, but cha usu su YouTube se. E wasi ya fear delegate ampa. Oh, enu kure, enu kure. Nemo se eni pano suyi nuhu se ampa. Na nini sema wakano. Se ebi ya oba obe ye bibi abu amu se di ebra yuche mono na police station for nuhu inhi ano na se wende ubi ba no kasi ebi ya me me di ameba me ya mawa ne kasi ano eti ni ma wamu se we di oba oba ba nuhu moden kakra. Delegates of Lejokuku here in Accra are also on the edge of their seats, anxiously anticipating the forthcoming November 4 Delegates Conference. We, uh, on Fear Delegates today, we introduce to you Stephen, a dedicated delegate from the Lejokuku constituency. We'll explore his views and experiences as he prepares to cast his crucial votes at the upcoming conference. I go by the name of Stephen Kwabna. I'm aspiring to be a politician one day. Because I, I, I had I had that kind of feeling and love for politics. Stephen Kwabna Ayensu is one of a few delegates in the Lejokuku constituency. In 2023, he concluded his national service program after earning his degree from the University of Education, Winneba. Currently, he finds himself among the ranks of unemployed graduates. His routine comprises aiding his parents with household tasks and manning their shop. He is eagerly looking forward to the November 4 NPP Delegates Conference. Internal party politics is more rough and deadly 
than the general politics or general elections. You don't want a showdown? So I'm looking at a showdown to the opponent, which is the NDC. I'm not looking at a showdown internally. Following the super delegates conference, numerous developments have unfolded. The most notable amongst them is Alan Chamantin's decision to part ways with the party, citing unfairness within the party's election procedures. For Steven, this move comes as no surprise. As a student of politics, I, I didn't see it at the news. I, 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 I didn't expect that to come. Though, but when it happened, I didn't expect that as a news. When look at the kind of campaign Alan was doing, he was not focused on the delegates. Even within the delegate, they, they were even saying that he is not even ready to lead. As compared to even Kennedy Japan, who in the beginning we all thought that he was joking. Top of his list of expectations is a candidate that will create opportunities for party folks. More importantly, can deliver a powerful blow to the NDC in the 2024 elections. And every political party is going to do everything regardless to win power. So for me, I would look at a candidate who will prioritize the party and make sure we are going to win power. That is the first person as a delegate I will look at. You can be in the political party from 92, from 90, whatever. But we are going to look at your loyalty, your service to the party. And now how you are going to deal with delegates, your message to delegates. What we delegates are also going to benefit in the party. Among the four remaining candidates vying to lead the MPP in the 2024 elections, Stephen has firmly made up his mind. I believe in two candidates that when they come, the constituency level, I believe in Dr. Bernardo Coboy leading the constituency, sorry, the party here again to capture the seat back for us. And it's a fact, wherever you go, everyone is calling for him. For the presidential, I can tell boldly that Dr. Mahmoud Baumia is ready because now politics is based on science and data. His decision is unwavering and not even a financial incentive will sway his determination. But for you, let me ask you personally, Stephen, will money change your mind or help you make a decision at all no no money cannot change my mind when you bring the money i'll take it when i bring me money like steven take this money if you are giving me the money to go and vote for you i'll let you know that no i'm not going to vote for you because i've already decided but if you are giving money because i'm a party member you feel like i should take something that one I'm, I'll, I'll welcome it so i'm sure you've heard this before fear delegate fear delegate fear de you're a delegate should we be afraid of you? I mean, should they be afraid of you? Yes, they need to be afraid of delegates because uh, you might go to someone to campaign for the person. When the person sees you, will tell you that, oh, yes, 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 I would vote for you. Oh, yomo, that's the, that's the word. Oh, yomo, what do you hear? You see, but once you turn, another person comes in with a different story. So you need to fear the delegate because in front of you, he's not going to tell you boldly that, oh, met one man with surety. Maybe because of what you will get us at that moment. For Steven and numerous other delegates, this election signifies their sole opportunity to influence the party's direction and they are determined not to miss it under any circumstance. Their ultimate goal is to make a well-informed choice that could potentially break the recurring eight-year political cycle for the MPP. For Joy News, Michael Ashale. It has now become a Tosho's uh, adventure for travelers using the Takrade Agunan Kwanza Highway. Unconfirmed reports suggest one person has lost his life using the stretch. Other commuters endure chaos, pain, and anguish as they have to wait for several hours in traffic to arrive at their destinations. According to reports for the past three days, the road has become impassable, forcing people to trek over several kilometers. Thomas Tete is a journalist journalist in Takwa. He used the road this morning. He joins us via Zoom with more on this. What's the situation, Thomas, on the road? You're right. Thank you very much, Aisha. Uh, the situation is very, very bad when you get to the Eusejo stretch. In fact, I was coming from Takwa to Takwa this morning. I had a meeting. I got to, I got closer to Eusejo, a little after Abwadi around 7.30 a.m. And we had to spend about uh, 30 extra minutes on the road. But looking at the time I was supposed to be ready for the meeting, I had to find another alternative. And so I had to go by an Okada. And I can tell you that the Okada and Pragya riders are really cashing in 
uh, making advantage, taking advantage of this to cash in. Because from that stretch to Bokro, where you can get a car to Takrade, they take between 10 to 20 cities per passenger. And so one, one uh, motor rider that I used, who was operating as an Okada, was telling me that from the day this particular incident started, four days ago, they have really cashed in a lot, and they are still going to uh, cash in uh, until the traffic is uh, freely flowing. So I really went through a lot of hell before I got to uh, the venue for my meeting, and apparently I, I, I reported late because I got here around 10, 30 a.m. when I was supposed to get here even before 9 for the meeting to start. It is not that easy. And looking at the situation, it doesn't seem like um, the, the, the traffic is going to flow uh, within uh, today. No, because that particular track is still locked in the rut at uh, Eusejo. And looking at how it is, it has been chalked with some uh, stumps and other things. Because you see that the track was trying to move and uh, was unable. And that is what actually caused that. And it is right in the middle of the road, making it very difficult for, for, for road users to, to use the road. And a lot of people slept on the road, I, per my investigation, a lot of people slept on the road throughout the night. And still, they have not been able to get to their destinations. Those who even left earlier got home very, very late. And so the situation in the western region, and for that matter, the Usejo Takradi Road, is so bad that we need urgent attention. And what is the police doing about it? Any intervention? Yes, on my way to Takradi, I saw whilst I was on the Okada, I saw the police on the road right at the Usejo. I also saw some military men also there as well, making sure that uh, there is uh, that direction so that there will not be uh, there will not be any traffic jam on the road. So I, I saw the police on the road and I saw that they were doing something. But as to whether they will be able to do something about that particular track for it to be uh, to be out of the road for the, the road to be free for traffic, I can't tell. Grateful for your time. Thomas is a journalist in Takwa, bringing us that update. Let's move straight to the Ashanti region for an update on the Anglonga fire. My colleague uh, Nana Boachi Yadom is there for us. Nana, what's the very latest from there? Then I was the latest, I mean, from the fire outbreak. For now, the fire attendants and fire, of, fire service officers have been able to um, quench the fire to some extent, um, not as we used to see earlier in the morning. They've been able to bring things under control. And as you can see over here, um, there's no smoke and there's no fire. They've been able to bring everything down. But then let's get interactive with the fire officer here at the Menshia and the Noforico municipality. Um, he and his men have been on ground since morning and they've been doing so well to make sure that um, the fire does not extend um, so much. Boss, you've been doing so much work since morning. What has been your observation so far? Oh, what we realize is this. They did not call us in, on time. They call us uh, after hour before the incidents that they call us. So on our arrival, we saw that the whole house was engulfed by the fire. Uh, here is the case. We are able to bring the fire down. How many houses so far have been affected by the outbreak? Now I can say it's one. It's one? One house with 21 bedrooms. 21 bedrooms. Yes. And how many properties? Properties worth how much? As for this one, unless the owners of the property who can tell us the worth of it. But then you, you, you made mention of the fact that the residents did not call you on time. When I spoke to some of them earlier, they said they called you right after the fire started, but then you did not arrive on time. What they are saying is not true. The thing is this, at times when you come and ask them, which number did you call? They will give you the number the fire service have even heard before. Uh, they don't have our numbers and they, don't, they do not call us on time. We had that, listen, 
the fire, they call us around 9.59, and we arrive at this place 10, 10 hours. So 10 after 10 that we arrive at this place. You check 9.59 and 10, 10 hours. Check the minutes that we used to arrive at this place. So far, can we say that everything is under control? Now I can say the fire is extinguished. Totally? It's totally extinguished. You will see a pocket of fires, uh, 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 fires here and there, but that one we, can, we don't call it fire. It's a pocket of fires that we are using uh, this in water to extinguish them. All right, your, your name, please. AD1 Asamoa Kennedy, Mensha Operations. Okay, so AD1 um, Asamoa Kennedy, it's Mensha Operations Officer. His men have been on ground. They've made sure that the fire um, is slowed down. For now, he says that everything is under control and then we will not have the fire spreading to the other buildings here at the Anwaraga of Forikro Municipality to be specific. But let me speak to this woman who uh, stays in this house that has been affected. Lanaya Obuache here on bringing us updates from the Anglonga Fire in uh, uh, Kumasi. The fire service personnel says the fire has been totally extinguished. Of course, we'll be bringing you more from uh, in our subsequent bulletin. Still to come in this bulletin, Adum FM is set to hold the 14th edition of its annual priest festival, Adum Priest, this year. We'll be bringing you more on this shortly plus business after this break. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Ghana placed 10th in Africa with the largest foreign direct investments in 2021 and 2022. That's according to Transactional Advisors, Bridgewater Advisors. However, it is contrary to the World Bank report where Ghana places second or third. Here's more in this report. Country recorded $1.5 billion in FDIs in 2022, lower than the $2.4 billion recorded a year before. However, in the first half of this year, the nation bagged $275 million in value as foreign investments. $230 million out of that were foreign direct investment. China was the largest destination in terms of FDIs to Ghana. The manufacturing and services sectors were the sectors that registered the largest FDIs in the country during the period under review. In terms of employment, a total of 6,247 jobs were created. Meanwhile, Egypt placed first with the biggest FDI to Africa in 2022. It was followed by South Africa in the second position, whilst Ethiopia was third. Now, the government through the Ghana Investment Promotion Center is exploring avenues to increase foreign direct investments as it engages a Danish-Swedish business delegation currently in the country. Speaking to Joy Business after a seminar in Accra, Minister of Information Kojo Pong Kuma said this is part of government's agenda of achieving economic diplomacy. Here's more. According to the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, foreign direct investments for 2021 amounted to $829.29 million, a 32% increase from the previous year. However, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development indicated that the COVID-19 pandemic impacted inflows in 2022 as global FDI decreased by a third to $1 trillion. But Minister for Information Kojo Pankruma is optimistic of a pickup in FDI's inflows going forward. The position of Ghana is I want to open up Ghana to do business with the rest of the world and in particular we want to attract a lot more investors to come operate in Ghana as a launch pad for reaching Africa and the rest of the world. Uh, consequent to that a lot of our ambassadors around the world are focusing heavily on what we call economic diplomacy and are working to attract a lot of businesses from their various jurisdictions back home into Ghana. And that's why you see how the ambassador from um, Denmark uh, and Sweden has uh, brought this business delegation uh, to come and tap into this focal area of uh, trying to onboard businesses here in Ghana so that they can uh, operate within the African region and uh, also support the world. So that's the first point. The second point is that what we are doing here is to assist these businesses to meet and engage with partners in the Ghanaian jurisdiction. And that's why you see a lot of Ghanaian businesses who are here to meet and do the B2B with them. 
the Danish Swedish Business Seminar provided an opportunity to orient the delegation on the investment trends and opportunities within multiple sectors in Ghana to guide their expansion and investment decisions. Yofi Grant is Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center. We want to position Ghana as your entryway into the African market, the market of well, a combined GDP of 3.4 trillion, but we go up to 6.7 trillion once we actualize some of the opportunities that we have. Both Denmark and Sweden um, are significant uh, players in the agri-processing market and a sector which is very important to us in Ghana. You are also both very important in the technology space, a space that Ghana is leveraging significantly for its development. And the um, government is digitalizing almost all its services um, to the citizen. But I believe even more significant is the fact that even on the ground, there are just so many opportunities um, for engagement. And uh, as we bring you here, we are not only looking for investment, but we are looking for investment for trade. And also leveraging on the SDGs to ensure that we trade in a sustainable but mutually beneficial way. The Danish-Swedish business delegation was led by the Ghana's ambassador to Denmark and Sweden, Sylvia Anno. And that's all for business and news continues after this break. Time now for sports and veteran boxer, uh, man, boxing manager and promoter Yofi Boham says former world champion Aikote would have had a better career if he stayed under his management. Korte breached management agreement with Boham in 1994, leading to an impasse that almost curtailed his career until former President Rowling stepped in to resolve the issue. Despite this, Korte went on to win a world title a year later, but Yofi recounts he would have had had a successful career if he did not breach the contract. I, I was disappointed and uh, my spouse at that time took all the papers heading towards uh, the court to restrain our court from fighting. Now the manager in US, Fred Berg, the late Fred Berg, meanwhile also took up the matter in US. And any time that Alfred was, uh, Ike was fighting, <laughs> Fred will issue summons. He was a Jew. Uh, did, did you have a contract with Ike? Oh, yes. And it was going for, for how many years? Uh, initially, it's always for four years. For four years. Either three or four in those days. In those days? Yes. And uh, it means that he breached the contract? Oh, yes. Yes. So if it, when he breached the contract, did he compensate you? Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't receive even a penny. Yes, I didn't receive even a penny. And uh, it wasn't a breach which was just uh, uh, smoothly done. It was rough. But, you know, it, it was something which was really... I took the boys to the UK for Alfred's uh, Commonwealth Championship fight. Straight away, I could take him to tell me that to... And that was my mistake. That to a friend of mine... Alaji Hearts has... Uh, Alaji Hearts, former of Hassafo? Oh, yes. Alaji Hearts has uh, 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 gracefully told him that uh, he, will, he will fund his ticket to London so he can... Uh, he will go along. I said, okay, because Alaji Hearts had been my friend for many years. When he was a ball boy and all that, uh, he was my friend during those days. And so... I, I agreed, and that was my downfall. That's how she was lured away from you? Yes. So, so how did you resolve the issue with I caught it? No, uh, but, uh, my wife had wanted to, bring, uh, to go to court. But that does it for Sports Hub Next. International Science and Maths quiz Opokuwari School ready to devour contenders as they make nine grand finale appearance. They are hungry and ready to devour any prey to clinch their third trophy after two decades. That's the desperate story of the Akatechis of Opokuwari School who make their ninth final appearance in 
hope of ending their 21-year trophy drought. The school is convincing their contestants, including their wonder form one boy, will bring the trophy to uh, Santasberg. The grand finale comes up uh, on, and you need to stay on the Join News channel for the grand finale. <clears throat> Adum FM is set to hold the 14th edition of its annual praise festival, Adum Praise, this year. This event, DAB, the choir's edition, will bring together 11 remarkable choir bands from various churches and independents to trill patrons at the ceremony. Speaking to Joy News, programs manager of Adum FM, Joshua Tigo, said this edition aims at appreciating the contribution of choirs in the Kenyan gospel music industry. I don't praise. I mean, the, the, the name itself, as, as in the brand name, I don't praise, is, is very popular because we started this product about some 14 years ago, in 2011. Um, but if you ask me about this year's I don't praise, which we call in the choirs edition, it's unique. It's novel in many ways. The first novelty of it is that, look, it's the first time a music concert in Ghana is bringing together over 400 singers on one stage. We are bringing about 11 choirs together, both denominational and non-denominational choirs. Now, that is the novelty. The other thing that is slightly different from the previous I don't praise that you can call novel is that it's the first time we are doing it on a Sunday. And that is because we, we do not want to depart from the church spirit on the Sunday. We want people to close from church and come and continue with the anointing that they have, they have soaked from their various churches. So that is the other novelty. I think the last of it, or maybe uh, one other one that I need to speak about, is that the first time we are starting at about 4 p.m., it's always been a bit late in the evening. We would start usually around 6 or 7 p.m. So it's actually the first time we are starting at 4 p.m. The venue remains the same anyway. So as it's, it's, it's always been with all the previous Adun Praise editions that anybody may have attended or may have watched. You certainly have no reason to miss this year's edition. That's how we wrap up the bulletin this afternoon. My name is Aisha Brian. Log on to myjournline.com. There's more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. Do enjoy the rest of our programs.